All right, and we're live. Uh, welcome back to The Horse Race, your weekly look at politics, policy, and elections in Massachusetts. I'm Jennifer Smith, and I'm here with Steve Cazella, president of the Mass Inc. Polling Group, and Stephanie Murray of Politico, Massachusetts. How are you two doing today? Doing all right. We're entering month three of quarantine, I guess, or month four. We're coming out of month three, so um, I, I suppose we've all adjusted to our new reality by now. Stephanie, how are you? I, you know, I'm doing good. Uh, I think we finally, we've worked out most of the kinks of our podcasting, which is uh, a good, a good thing. But speaking of podcasting, before we get into anything else, we wanted to just acknowledge all of, you know, the sweeping, the protests across the country that are happening right now, even as we're talking over the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis um, and over police brutality. There are legislative solutions, you know, coming left and right over what to do. Uh, this is the biggest topic in the United States right now, and we are going to be watching it for a long time. Uh, so we just wanted to mention that right off the bat. It's something that we are aware of and paying attention to. Absolutely. And uh, we spent the entire episode on it last week. I'd encourage everybody to go listen to, to that. Um, Jen spent the whole episode talking with Boston City Councilor Andrea Campbell about her reaction to the protests as well as um, steps forward. So if you haven't already listened to that, I would very much encourage you to do so. I'd also add that a lot of what we talk about on this podcast, I think, has to do with some of the issues that are underlying the protests and some of the systemic inequities that exist in our society. Um, we're talking today about a poll that we did on housing, which shows some of that um, it's very, it, I shouldn't say that, it shows it in very clear, very clear terms, you know, what the percentages are of, peop of people in different groups who are experiencing um, housing insecurity, food insecurity, uh, who have had COVID in their household. That's another thing which is closely related to, to that set of issues. And then later on in the show, we're talking about another closely related issue um, with our good friend Juana Matias, COO of Mass Inc. Um, we're talking with her about, about um, elections and, and the representation and how the state legislature and local governments as well are both very unrepresentative of the people who live here in Massachusetts. So the issues are all certainly very much on our mind, um, bo both in terms of what we talked about last week and, and the issues that we're gonna be covering this week. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, uh, some of these also came up in the context of um, a race that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about, which is the race for the Massachusetts Senate. So, you know, the federal Senate. It's people from Massachusetts running for the Senate. And, uh, and in this case, we've got Ed Markey being challenged by Joe Kennedy. And uh, we are now on debate three, 1700. I don't know, but we're going to talk about where that's at right now. So here we go. <laughs> Last night, tensions rose during the debate for the Massachusetts Senate. Current Senator Ed Markey and challenger Congressman Joe Kennedy took to the stage to kind of verbally attack each other from a safe, socially distant six feet apart. Uh, Stephanie, you and the rest of us were watching the debate pretty closely. So for those who missed it, who were doing something else on a Tuesday night, what were the highlights? What about the landscape of the race has changed, if anything? I think the, the most clear thing from the debate earlier this week was that the race is finally getting real. The campaigns have been kind of separated from each other and forced to operate totally online for the past several months because of coronavirus. You know, the big state convention got canceled, for example. They can't not door knock or hold rallies. So, you know, this clashing is finally happening, especially, you know, there are fewer than 100 days out. And it seems like it's going to be a pretty tight race between Joe Kennedy and Ed Markey. And they both have, you know, their career on the line, their reputation on the line, and only one person can win. Yeah, and they were really fired up, too, when we were watching it. Um, there's been kind of an escalation over the course of all of these debates. My hot take is that I've gone uh, fairly rapidly from kind of terribly bored to now sort of interested, because if you recall the first debate, they were sort of politely sniping at each other from uh, a seated position, and then they stood up and got a little bit more aggressive. And now Ed Markey is openly saying Congressman Kennedy is... I think it was literally progressive in name only. So that was quite an escalation, wasn't it? Yep. And that wasn't just a mistake uh, that he said out loud. You know, his campaign ran with it after the debate. He repeated it in the spin room with reporters. They released um, a video of him saying it that went pretty viral. So uh, if you expected this race to stay really positive and for both candidates to just kind of focus their ire on President Trump, uh, that's out the window now. It's Things are finally starting to heat up. Yeah, that definitely didn't happen, at least in this last, last debate. There were some specific things, though, that Markey mentioned um, 
other than just the video that he posted later that says, hey, look, Congressman Kennedy actually likes me. There were some specific things that he mentioned when he said that Kennedy was uh, progressive in name only, right, Stephanie? That's right. Um, he pointed to Kennedy's work um, before he was a member of Congress working for a, I believe it was a district attorney who's a Republican, uh, but Kennedy hit right back and said, you know, Senator Markey, you voted for the 1994 crime bill and you were opposed to the desegregation of Boston schools in the 1970s. Uh, so, you know, they both came kind of armed with opposition research on each other and it made for a pretty, pretty good fight and an entertaining debate. Yeah. What uh, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I was going to say uh, one question that we uh, that's been asked a lot around this race that we even asked when Congressman Kennedy was on the horse race live a while back is just the basic question of why he's running and why he would be a better senator than Ed Markey. Are we any closer now? I guess we're three months out. Any closer to having an answer to that, a clear answer to that question, Stephanie? I mean, that's I, I don't think Senator Markey feels that way. You know, he opened his he started his closing statement at the end of the debate. The first words out of his mouth were, I know why I'm running for the United States Senate. But if you listen to Kennedy, uh, it's, you know, I don't know if he sums it up in a, in a super short elevator pitch. But basically what he's saying is that he wants to, you know, bring a different kind of energy to the seat and maybe raise the national profile of the Senate seat and kind of be that outspoken national voice on issues like Elizabeth Warren has. Um, for Massachusetts in the Senate or maybe like an AOC or something like that. But Markey's been kind of able to, with the Green New Deal, become sort of a national voice on climate change. So I think uh, he does, he, you know, he gives his reason for running, but I think that some folks don't always want to hear it. One of the things that I found really interesting kind of in their back and forth was that they both seem to be sort of taking terms, calling each other uh, essentially ineffective. Specifically, Kennedy got a question. He was pressed about a ranking by the University of Virginia and Vanderbilt University, which dis uh, which determined that he was the second least effective lawmaker in Massachusetts during the last uh, session of Congress, and he was slightly below Markey's respective score for the Senate. Um, and uh, Kennedy, of course, kind of pointed some barbs at Markey, saying, "You haven't gotten a ton of stuff done either." <laughs> so they always also, of course, all offer different rationales in in one way, of course, saying that's a complete misread of what I've been trying to do. Markey points to a lot of legislation that he's put forward. And Kennedy points out that, uh, you know, Democrats were in the minority in the House and they've been facing a pretty recalcitrant Senate. So what was your take, Stephanie, on kind of how they're trying to frame how each of them would be a more useful member of the Senate than the other? I think you know, the, the most clear part of the debate was when they did a lightning round and they asked them, uh, the moderators asked their opinions on a series of questions where they just had to answer yes or no, and they agreed on all of them. And so when it comes to voting um, and being in the Senate, you know, it would probably be sort of a wash. They would be uh, voting pretty similarly. Uh, so, you know, it comes down to like, are you able to build coalitions? Are you able to get bills through and work across the aisle with Republicans? Um, and in this political climate, you know, I think it's really hard for anybody on the Democratic side to get a lot done with a Republican president, with a Republican Senate majority. And so what Kennedy's case that he was making was that he traveled to a bunch of states in 2018 to help flip the House, to put the House back into Democratic hands, uh, which did happen, um, not only because of Kennedy, of course, uh, but, you know, it's something that happened. And so uh, and he knocked Markey for not um, going and doing that. But his other criticism of Markey is that he's not in Massachusetts enough. So it's kind of an interesting parallel to talk about, you know, being out of state a lot and how it's a good thing, but Markey being out of state a lot is a bad thing. Yeah, actually, like you raise a really interesting point there. One of the things that that kind of is tricky in, in debates like this and in races like this is the question of what exactly do you want an elected official to be doing? Um, uh, back at our post-2018, let's see if I can remember that because it was a while ago, uh, our post-2018 election. Ancient history, I think. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? What What is time? 
Um, but uh, we had Representative Catherine Clark on the uh, on the podcast during a live show, and she was talking at length about the efforts that she was making to bring in new potential uh, candidates uh, for the Democrats. And Kennedy, of course, was also active during that race as well in kind of trying to support other Democrats running. Um, but then, of course, one of the things that was levied at Senator Elizabeth Warren when she was planning on running for president is that people in Massachusetts wanted her to just kind of stick around and uh, be a senator. So it always is a little bit interesting to me as these folks are running what they think the brief is for the senator from Massachusetts. And one more thing that I'd love to point out before we move on is just kind of where things stand in this race, especially as they've been, like I said before, to push basically totally online and on television. Um, the climate really favors Joe Kennedy. He has over a million Facebook followers and he broadcasts to them every single day, sometimes multiple times a day, whereas Marky only has 57,000 followers on Facebook. And on Twitter, it's it's a similar, I don't think the, the distance is as great between them, but still Kennedy kind of comes out on top. He's also very well financed. He has $6.2 million in his war chest. Mark, he only has $4.4 million. And an outside group, an environmental group says it's going to start spending money for Marky, and in a matter of hours, another outside group says it's organizing to raise a bunch of money for Kennedy. So part of the reason you saw Marky come out really swinging at this debate was that he's, in a lot of ways, he's behind and he needs to, he needs to catch up and drum up some attention. And I think he was able to do that. Right. Well, we're going to shift away from the Massachusetts Senate for a second and shift on over to housing. So what have we got? We have a very special guest, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that guest is Steve. So there's new data out from the Massing Polling Group uh, that found that Massachusetts homeowners and renters continue to struggle financially because of the coronavirus crisis, which comes as no surprise. The results of the poll found that many residents can't pay their full rent or they can't pay part of it or they're behind on their mortgage payments. And the state's eviction moratorium is set to expire in August and a significant portion of people who are behind on their rent say that they won't be able to catch up by then. So switching hats from co-host to guests of the pod. And you know, Steve, I always, I struggle. Is it crown prince of polling, Steve Cazella? Is that the title you prefer? <laughs> you know what? There's a lot of pods I could be on, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> starting to starting to take exception to how I've been described here. I uh, know seriously, we did just re release a poll this morning. Um, it's on massingpolling.com, all the details that we're talking about. So please do shameless plug. Go take a look, uh, top line cross tabs and some, some of the charts we're going to be looking at also. Um, but Stephanie, as you mentioned in your mostly kind introduction, um, it's uh, the main point of what we are looking at was housing and how specifically how residents in Massachusetts are faring when it comes to housing. Um, so we have some some figures here that I'm that I'm going to just breeze through and, and that kind of, I think, tell the, the very high level story. But again, there's we've also written it up on Commonwealth, which goes into a bit more depth. Um, so this first thing then, what it, uh, what it shows is, is just straight economic distress. Um, so we basically broke, broke economic distress into four categories. And what this slide shows is the percent of each of these demographic groups that's in the most it's either in the more or most distressed category. Um, and I think the, the, reason, the thing that's compelling about this and the reason I wanted to start with it is because it shows the huge, huge disparities. Um, so just so distress in this case means you've either missed all or part of one of your housing payments, you've struggled with food insecurity, um, or you've, you're either unemployed or furloughed um, or lost pay. So basically anything related to this crisis that's happened to you uh, kind of pushes you up into one of the, the higher categories. And this is the top, the percent in the top two. So yeah. you can see, for instance, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was going to say, I mean, the thing that's obviously jumping out to us looking at this, but for folks listening is, of course, there's a very extreme racial disparity. Can you tell us what you were finding there and if there's any intersection between the economic distress and uh, any other factors you were looking at? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the, the second group of bars from the bottom here shows, um, for those listening later, 50% uh, of Hispanic respondents, 45% of Black respondents in one of the top two uh, economic distress categories. Then you look at white and Asian respondents and we're down in the mid-teens. So a, a huge, huge disparity there. 
One of the things that we found looking at all the numbers in this poll sort of put together is that the people is that people are suffering multiple and compound crises. So we think of this sort of as, or often it's presented in the news as sort of uh, there's the public health and there's the economic. Um, but the economic is really affecting the same people with a lot of different factors. It's affecting people with by bringing on job losses, by bringing on food insecurity, and making it harder and harder to pay rent. Um, so yeah, big economic disparities and also big disparities by age. Um, this one shows, uh, th th this chart that we're looking at now shows demographics, the demographics of people who say that they've missed at least part of their housing payments between April and June. Um, and again, for those listening later on the live stream, it's 35% of people under age 30 have missed a housing payment since April. It's one in three. Um, then when you go up to people who are over 60, you've got 4%. So just again, huge, huge gaps in how this this whole crisis has been been impacting people. That's so interesting, especially the age the age group is so interesting to me. Is there do you know why that is that people under thirty were so susceptible to not being able to pay their rent because of this? Yeah, I mean, a big part of it, I think, well, it's a bunch of things. One is the type of job that many people under age 30 have. So um, another thing that we you can see on this chart is that it's people employed part time um, who who were struggling more. Uh, we didn't ask it in this particular poll, but it but if you ask salaried or hourly, um, hourly has had a much more difficult time in this as well. Um, so I think it, it, it's those things. It's also just time to, to accrue savings. You know, people, of course, over age 60, many of them don't even have housing payments anymore. So there's that that's influencing this as well. If you own your house outright, of course, you can't have missed a housing payment. Um, <clears throat> but it's that, that combined with savings, type of job, how long you've been in that job, and so forth, all have kind of come together to really impact um, people under age 30 much more severely than people, um, people at the other end of the age, age spectrum. And how is this actually interacting with the type of housing that you're living in? Um, I'm seeing there's 29% uh, of people uh, who rent say they have missed a housing payment. Uh, how's that relating to people who own? Yeah, so the number for people who own is 13%. Um, so oh, wow. there's, yeah, it's a pretty big difference um, between people who rent and people who own who have missed housing payments. Um, and the other, the the thing, I mean, that in and of itself, I think is is sort of alarming. The, the other thing that's, that's uh, that to kind of keep an eye on is that, um, am I sharing just the slides now or? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing to kind of keep an eye on is that these numbers are probably going to get worse. Um, so what we did here was we just asked how many people have missed uh, April, May, and June, April, May, or June, I should say, and then looking ahead for people who have are fully paid now, basically how much longer could you keep this up? And we use that to show what the percentage of renters would be able to continue or think they would be able to continue paying rent. Um, and it falls to about two thirds in a month or two, then down to 57%, down to 53%. You know, it drops pretty dramatically the longer this sort of current economic situation continues. That's really striking. See, were there policy proposals that people who are going through the support or changes that they'd like to see that they expressed in this poll? Yeah, we asked about a bunch of that stuff. And it wasn't even just people who are necessarily directly affected. We actually found just majorities of people in general support a lot of the policy proposals that that are that are out there that um, experts and advocates say would would potentially help us through help uh, people experiencing this, these issues. Um, to work through it. So uh, this slide here shows the percent who support each of a variety of policy proposals. Um, the top one here being um, requir requir requiring mortgage lenders to modify the terms of home loans. Um, that one gets about, that one gets 83% support. Um, rent support, basically funding programs to help renters who have lost jobs and income due to the crisis. That one we see at 74%. The next one is is uh, is one I expect we'll be hearing a lot about soon, which is the idea of extending the eviction moratorium. Um, for those unfamiliar, right now there's a moratorium on evictions that lasts through April. Uh, I'm sorry, lasts through August of this year. Um, the idea of extending that through the end of 2020 gets 75 percent support, um, and then you also see pretty strong majorities for just building and improving affordable housing. So, majority support for a lot of different ideas here. 
Yeah, well, I mean, so you're kind of taking a look ahead with with that data as well as potential um, policy proposals, but kind of more broadly, what is your grasp right now on what the future of this discussion is looking like? Will people be able to start paying for housing again at any specific points, especially if the unemployment insurance stops rolling in? Um, You know, there are questions about what reopening plans mean for people, whether they're expected to get back to work, whether they're protected if they choose not to for health reasons? Like, is there anything to kind of help us look a little bit further than just like this horrible cesspool that we're in right now? Yeah, I mean, the thing that um, I don't know that it offers really much reason for optimism in this data, but it does perhaps help us look forward a little. We asked about the idea, we asked um, how many, how likely it would be that people who had fallen behind thought it was that they'd be able to catch up um, by the time the current moratorium expires. Um, and 21% called it very likely. 21% of renters who have fallen behind said it was very likely they'd be able to catch up on rent by the time August rolls around. Um, so not not a lot of reason for optimism there. Um, and then the other thing I think that that we I have not heard as much discussion of, but which we discovered in, in collecting this data is we also asked in the same survey about Corona or COVID in the household. Basically, has anyone in your household either suffered from the symptoms or been tested positive for COVID and found there's, again, huge, huge disparities in terms of um, what in terms of uh, COVID rates, depending on how much distress you're going through. Um, so this is a chart for, um, that we did for, for WBUR that you should be seeing now. Um, and I'm just showing the WBUR story. Um, but you can see that the red bars here are the percent in each of the economic distress categories that say they've either test, had someone in the household test positive, or the blue bars are the percent who said someone has had the symptoms. And for those listening later, the differences are huge, huge differences. So those with those who haven't had any of the economic issues, 1% say they've had someone in the household test positive. Um, you look at uh, the, the group that's the most distressed and it's 26%. So it's big disparities and it's not even... You can't just look at the demographics either and and see oh well of course it's the it's these demographic groups that are in the most distress even within the demographic groups the people within those groups who have had the most issues are more likely to have um, had someone in their household experience COVID. so that's another challenge i think which which is one that will you know that's just making things worse for the people already suffering economically and it makes sense like when you think about it, but to see the data laid out like that is just like, it's just so stunning and how tough, like when it rains, it pours, it seems during this during this crisis. And we actually have a question from Kevin Gilnack who's watching live with us on Facebook for Steve. And he said, isn't there data showing millennials were more likely to be laid off during this crisis than baby boomers? Um, and is that is that the case, Steve? Yeah, we've certainly seen big, big economic disparities um, between in age groups. I um, unfortunately closed most of my windows before we started this cast, so I can't give you the exact data. Um, but perhaps we could put it in the Facebook notes later, um, or maybe Rich Parr, who's watching live, could could <laughs> dig those differences up. Um, but I, I don't. It certainly is the case that young people have been much harder hit economically. But whether or not it's um, what the percentages are specific to layoffs. It, it, we, I don't have it on the right here. The other one, though, that's made some of the unemployment information a bit difficult to, to talk about in ways that we're familiar with is that furloughs are something that is not necessarily something that huge percentages of the population were usually experiencing, but now they are. Um, so uh, what, how exactly to just even describe what's each of the different employment situations people are going through has become more difficult. Right. Well, I mean, Steve, you'll definitely continue to poll on it and we'll continue to ask you about said polling. Um, So let's move on to our next topic, uh, because last week, the Massachusetts Black and Latino Caucus unveiled a 10 point plan to address police violence and advance racial justice. We talked about a few of the proposals um, on the podcast last week, because this is, of course, a time when national focus is trained on how elected officials will take action against racism. 
So we think it's worth re-examining how representative those officials are. In Massachusetts, our representation is pretty overwhelmingly white. And this was illustrated in a 2019 report conducted by MassInc. So joining us to talk about representative state leadership in Massachusetts is COO of Mass Inc. and former state rep of the 16th Essex District and former candidate for the Massachusetts third, Juana Matias. Welcome, Juana. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. It's such a pleasure to join you to talk about a topic that I think is really important. And I think it's timely with what's happening nationally. Great. So the point, the report that MassInc put out in November was examining the state of governance in Massachusetts, and it illustrated just how imbalanced our st state's representation is on the basis of sex and race. Mm -hmm. So issues of race parity in our elected leadership here in Massachusetts is not new, but this is kind of a, a new moment to sort of reflect with the outrage and demand for change, focusing again on who represents us. So do you think the legislature is going to start generating ideas for policies promoting legislative diversity in any way? I would hope so. I mean, if you notice our report focused on the unbalanced representation that currently exists by race, gender, ethnicity, and also by party affiliation. Um, you know, we 52% of adults in the state are women. However, only 29% of those members in the House are women. We would need another 31 members of color to be able to reach some form of parity that's representative in terms of our communities of color across the state. And so there's a lot of work to do. And then when you look at leadership, both in the House and the Senate, Currently, there are 16 members in leadership in the House. Not one person of color sits on that committee, although I will say they did have two members last year, Byron Russian, Representative Russian, and Representative Sanchez, who were replaced by new um, members in the State House. Same in the Senate. So it's disturbing, right? I remember my time in the State House, walking the hallways, being in conference committees, and I'd look to my left, I'd look to my right and white males. So we're clearly not delivering on making sure that those who are feeling the most pain, our underserved populations needs are really being met. And I think with what's happening nationally, it should just bring in greater attention that we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we're addressing the systematic racial inequities that exist in education, in transit, in housing, in policing, in our court system. I mean, it's there. And I think it's time we do something. We don't talk about it, but that we start seeing our governmental agencies really respond in significant ways to address these issues. When I see that stat, the statistic that you'd need 31 more members of color in the legislature to, to get to parity, I mean, it's so, how long do you think that would take when it seems like there are so few challenges to members who are already in? And then if you do run in a primary, uh, you end up, you know, the odds are just stacked against you with the power of incumbency. So how long, if, you know, like, how long would it take? Yeah, I don't think it's a responsibility that should just fall on our state house. I think there are nonprofits across our state that can engage in this work. I think it also falls on, you know, members really supporting candidates of color to get involved. I think we also need more supports for candidates of color. One of the biggest burdens that I noticed in my time and wanting to run for state rep and then running to run for Congress is money. You know, you're talking about you need money to be able to prove to people that you're committed to their issues and advocating on their behalf. And so I think that's a question we need to talk about. How do we get rid of money and politics so that we're really setting up those candidates that really care about making a difference? And it's not necessarily driven about driven by who can raise the most money and mount a campaign and have the most successful consultants leading leading their race. I think at the um, state level, you know, I've been part of the Black and Latino Caucus. I've been in those rooms where we're talking about the education gaps that continue to exist. Uh, I've been in the rooms when we talk about the fact that our state police isn't diverse in any way, shape, or form. And we bring these issues up time and time again, and nothing is happening. So um, if what's happening nationally now isn't enough to cause change, then I think the only way we can we can get, you know, a more diverse um, candidates involved really involves, you know, grassroots initiatives as well. It's not just going to be on government, you know, um, when you're an incumbent, you want to serve. Um, but how do you ensure that you're injecting opportunities for others to get involved? And I think for people of color, money continues to be one of the biggest hurdles. 
I also thought the chart in the Mass Forward report was great, and I, I did not make this chart, so I'm not complimenting myself. This was uh, Ben Foreman and his his team's great work on uh, local government, particularly in the gateway cities, where um, looking at the uh, racial and ethnic diversity of local government in the state of Massachusetts, um, which I think, of course, plays into then who is ready to run for uh, for state legislative positions when they become available. Um, and the, it just shows that in, in every gateway city to varying degrees, but in every gateway city, there's some gap between um, the percent of, uh, of elected leaders and the percent of residents who are people of color. And what, how, because that does become a feeder to state legislative positions, how do we, how do we change that? Where do we, where do we look to um, try to create a more, rep, more representative local leadership in Massachusetts? Yeah, it's been interesting. I don't know if you guys follow the Lowell lawsuit, right? where currently all seats are, are, are at large. So it makes it difficult, you know, if you are part of a community that is diverse to run at a, for an all, all at large seat. But Lowell, there was a lawsuit, they won the lawsuit. I know that the city of Haverhill is now thinking about the same very issue. All of our seats are at large. This is leaving pockets of Haverhill unrepresented for. The majority of city councilors all live on the same street not necessarily representing other parts of the city, and it's just not productive to democracy and representation. So I know the mayor there, Mayor Fiorentini, has actually taken a very public stand and saying, I'm for a charter change, and we should do this before we see a lawsuit just like Lowell did. So it's been, in my opinion, very comforting to see some local action in some of these um, municipalities and gateway cities saying, we know we don't have the right structure in place. We know this continues to prevent um, members in, in, in especially in our in, in in our gateway cities that are predominantly immigrant from getting involved in being voices for themselves. So I think that's needed. I'd hope that we wouldn't need to mount lawsuits, right? Because our municipalities are struggling. We're in COVID nineteen has had huge impacts. We know they're going to be deficits. So hopefully that's not the path they take. But people coming together and saying, you know what, this is maybe not the best format. And how do we make decisions internally ourselves? Um, to ensure that we're opening, the, we're opening this up for everyone in our communities. Um, I think that the school committees and the city council can definitely be feeders to potential state and federal office. Um, if you look, um, Ben has done some interesting research. If you actually look at our school committee, predominantly across gateway cities, they're very white. Although student population currently continues to grow and is more students of color. So that's an area we need a lot of work on because you know, these students come with cultural inclinations, the way you talk to their parents, the way you, you engage their parents is very different. And when you have school committee members who don't represent the students and their needs, it's very difficult to advocate in a way that could lead to educational gains and, and attainment. So I think it's an area of work that, um, that needs a lot more work. Um, again, you know, there isn't this blue book. There are times that you see uh, state representatives or even city councilors or school committee members whose parents were a school committee member, whose parent ran for state office, whose boss was that state rep. And so there's, there's access to information, there's access to resources, there's access to a network that members of, of, of color don't have access to. So how do we how do we change that? How do we get some form of nonprofit or organizations to engage in this work? You know, my congressional race wouldn't have been possible without the support of an entity called New Politics. There they were, you know, and, and with 17 candidates running in the third district, and they were absolutely instrumental in my race from even knowing that you need to hire consultants to connecting me to consultants to connecting me to a, a Rolodex list of uh, potential donors in Massachusetts. And so that made my campaign possible. Although we weren't victorious, there I was. And at the end of the day, I was able to prove to my community that we can be a voice for ourselves and that we do belong in these places. So organizations like that, I think, need to be continued to support, be supported because they make the difference for candidates like myself. And it would be great to see um, new new forms of programs of this nature to to exist you know i was a part of the name is escaping myself and it shouldn't be because all women in massachusetts have gone through it um, merge. emerge so emerge right in my first race for state rep i did the boot camp uh over a three pay, uh, day period and it, again super helpful for someone who had never run i don't have this blue book 
that tells you these are the next steps you need to take to mount a, a successful campaign. But eMERGE was super, super helpful um, and getting me kind of prepared to, to, to run for state office here in Lawrence. And then, of course, the question kind of turns to what the actual conversation is once you're in office there. Just a few years ago, you were the member of a member of the Black and Latino Caucus, as you mentioned. Right now, we're kind of in a moment where there's a renewed focus on the problems of not having a representative group of, uh, of electeds. Um, how are you feeling the conversation has shifted when it comes to racial justice? So of course, uh, members of the Black and Latino Caucus just put out the 10 point plan to address police brutality on several different uh, state, local and federal levels. Have we gotten better at talking about racial justice in the legislature itself or is there kind of still a lot of way to go? It's a good question, Jennifer. Um, I think there's still a long way to go. You know, I was in a call yesterday and people were like, I'm hopeful. I'm feeling so hopeful because of these protests. This is not the first time a black male loses his life, you know, to police. Um, there are so many instances where we want to, you know, proclaim victory. Uh, you know, the Student Opportunity Act, such a remarkable step in the right direction. But for generations, I'm talking about generations, students of color have been left behind in the state. So I think, yes, it's very important that we recognize that we're taking the right step forward, but we're not moving with the urgency that some of these issues demand. And once we get there, we're trying to implement gradual policy that I don't think is as expansive and intensive as it should be. So I think there's a long way to go. And I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this, uh, direct representativeness. Can a white elected official advocate on, on behalf of a community of color? Yes, but can they do so in the same way of my lived experience? No, right? Like I, I know what it is to be an English language learner because I lived it in the classroom and I understand the difficulties that I faced, you know, navigating the K through 12 system. You know, I understand what it is to see parents who don't speak English, uh, making minimum wage, working day to day, paycheck to paycheck just to get by. You know, those things really cement the way I look at the world and the way that I, you know, try to, to address issues in a way that if you haven't lived that, it's really hard. Um, for you to have the same urgency that I feel. I think you can be an ally, an advocate, but I think we need to make sure that we're creating pathways so that our elected bodies look like the communities we're there to serve. Well, this is something that we're gonna continue to watch in the weeks, months, and years ahead, but thank you so much for joining us, Mass Bank Chief Operating Officer Juana Matias, former state representative and Massachusetts third congressional district candidate. Such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Steve. And thank, thank you, you Jennifer. Such a pleasure. I look forward to joining again. All right, Steve, all you. <laughs> all right, well, that brings us to our final segment, which we um, do not have anything for you in terms of trivia this week. So instead we have something to watch and we have um, something that Jen and Stephanie are both watching. Stephanie and Jen, what are you watching this week? We are watching for something that we'd like to watch, which is the body camera footage from Boston police from a few of the protests over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I've been really closely watching WVUR's coverage of this in particular. They've been seeking that body camera footage and they haven't gotten it yet. Yeah, and the context here, of course, is I've been covering the body camera question for about six to seven years now. Um, uh, I talked a little bit with Councilor Andrea Campbell about that last week because she's the head of the criminal, um, the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee in Boston, and they've been trying to have hearings about the body camera issue um, because the rollout in the city of Boston has been kind of weird, to put it lightly, where um, at some points they've just put it out in specific neighborhoods neighborhoods without really telling anyone until after they were out, but then not, of course, uh, necessarily putting cameras on uh, certain officers like bicycle cops at the same time as they would for other officers. So what I'm watching right now is to not just see whether they release the specific body camera footage, but if uh, the city of Boston is going to kind of come forward with a broader explanation of where it stands with body cameras right now and what it hopes they'll be used for and what kind of modes of accountability exist to make sure that if you see something like the protests that you know the public can get access to that footage to make sure there wasn't additional overreach in the context of police brutality protest 
What about you? Were you watching anything, Steve? <laughs> Nothing that serious, I'm afraid. Um, to, you know, uh, for me, I think that I'm, I've become fascinated with uh, with the uh, presidential election. You know, for, for in most years, I think we all would have been watching this for much longer. But this year, there's just been so much else going on that certainly there has been some attention paid to it, but nowhere near, I think, the usual amount. Um, even our just from a polling standpoint, the, the policy stuff we're doing is getting much more attention than it usually does, and we're doing we're just doing less elections polling. So, um, but now you know we are um, kind of getting into the summer and um, getting toward where people. Will start. Will you know? Voters will really start to um, be paying more attention as well. So uh, right now, what we're seeing is Joe Biden actually has has gotten a bump. You know, Joe Biden is in a lot of these polls up by 10, 12, 13, 14 per percentage points. So um, major, major kind of margin for Joe Biden, at, at least in terms of what recent, the recent polling has looked like. So um, that's what I'm starting to watch, and um, plenty of time left to go on that one. So you Which, may be perhaps the only person watching the presidential race when we're all <laughs> consumed by other stuff. Well, it, it is just one of those examples, right, of how everything is bleeding into everything else. I mean, it's hard to have a conversation right now about the federal government that isn't completely integrated into all of the local issues that we're dealing with right now. Of course, yeah, even definitely. thinking about, you know. Um, the issues around uh, protests and racial justice, you know, those are happening on the local level, but they are intimately in conversation with the um, the way the, they're being addressed on the federal level from the way that the president is handling it sets up a direct contrast with the way that other local officials handle it. So nothing is local, nothing is federal, everything's in between. Absolutely. Um, but we are not in between anything. We're at the end of everything, at least the end of this episode. So uh, th this is all the time that we have today. I'm Steve Cazella. I'm here with Stephanie Murray and Jen Smith, our producer this week and every week is Libby Gormley. Um, we'd appreciate it if you'd subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And please do do leave us warm, positive, fuzzy ratings and reviews because it makes us feel good and also helps others find us online. Um, please do also sign up for the Massachusetts Political Playbook and call us at the Massing Polling Group if you need polling. Um, but for now, thank you all so much for listening slash watching, and we'll see you next week. See ya.